So you want to become a command line wizard, huh? Yeah. Yes, okay. So, yeah, this talk, um, basically, um, it's gonna be, sorry? Too quiet? Louder. I think the microphone is not. It's not? Hello, hello. Oh, yes. there we go. Okay. I'm sorry, it's a bit, I'm a quite a tall person, so I'm gonna have to leap forward a little bit. So, yes. Um, in this talk, I'm gonna show you uh, quite a few new command line tools, and in fact, I'm gonna give this talk on the command line, um, and um, the, the takeaway is supposed to be, at least, that you know some new tools at the end of this, and you basically don't have to know anything before that, like you don't even have to know how to get around any kind of Unix system. Um, and um, one thing to note is that um, even though I'm gonna be presenting many tools and many alternatives to uh, well-known tools, this is not meant to be like that you have to replace your old ways of doing things, it's just like that you can supplant, supplant your current knowledge with some new tools and um, these tools are mainly meant to be for interactive usage and not so much for script usage. For script usage you should always kind of use the old tools that you're used to because they are most likely not going to be available on the systems that you're going to be scripting for. So, with that said, let's talk about me just a very quick. Um, so yeah, I'm a command line enthusiast, as you might have figured. Um, I'm an Arch Linux developer. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I use Arch, by the way. Um, and yeah, and I work as a DevOps consultant, freelance. So, why even bother? Sorry, this was meant to be like this. Um, why even bother with the command line? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, so command line is not going, gonna go away. It's been here for like many decades. Um, it's gonna be here for some more decades. Um, might as well embrace it. Um, it's efficient for many kinds of tasks. It's not so efficient for other kinds of tasks, but the, you know, you should pick the right kinds of tasks to use the command line for, right? Or rather pick the command line for the right kinds of tasks. And sometimes you just can't use a GUI, right? Uh, sometimes you're logged into some servers. Now me working as DevOps, I, I log into many servers a day and uh, basically, I really gotta know my tools around that, and you can't always have an X server, it's really not possible. Um, and yeah, text is still the only truly universal exchange format, despite what other people might tell you. Um, and yes, the slides themselves, I'm just gonna go ahead, they, they are on the command line. Yeah, right? <laughs> I want to draw your attention to the fact that we have fade out effects and fade in effects. Watch this. <laughs> All right. So, um, don't worry, you don't have to memorize this. This is just like an overview because this is essentially a completely live kind of affair that we're going to have going here. Um, so, uh, please cut me some slack if something goes wrong, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, we're gonna be looking at some tools and some common tasks and how, what you were probably used to and then what you might be wanna using now. So let's have a look, right? So first of all, EXA. EXA is a tool for listing files. Now you might know that you can list files in uh, Unix systems using LS and tree, um, but EXA is pretty by default and it has Git support. So let's take a look what that means, right? So a uh, normal LS looks like this. All right, it's a pretty, pretty plain. So my LS looks like this because I have some areas to make it pretty, but usually if you log into some default system, it looks like this, right? But EXA um, also looks like this by default. But now this is not really um, so fun, is it? So um, let's, for, for fairness sake, let's use ls-l uh, and use my, oh shit, this is a bit, I don't want it to wrap. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see whether I can, can you guys see that at the back? Is this, okay, great. Um, and then I'm gonna keep it like this so it doesn't wrap. So, um, so we can see here what uh, the ls-l uh, output looks like. So it lists my user, the attributes, lots of stuff. Um, it's not particularly helpful though for if you wanna know the real sizes, you gotta do this, right? So that you get the human readable sizes and everything could be more colorful, right? You could always make it more colorful. Basically, the trend nowadays is to make everything more colorful and so you got exa-l <laughs> and uh, now it's very colorful. You can see here that uh, the, the attributes are all colorized, so you can easily skim that. Um, the, uh, the sizes are human readable by default, 
Um, the user is actually, my user is Twinstaro, so it's like yellowish, and the root user, which is not my user, is just kind of like grayish. And then the other thing is also readable. Now, the, the way the, um, the files are colored is that uh, executable files um, that have the executable flag on, the, on this side here, uh, they are green, so you can see these as green. Uh, multimedia files are like violet and so on and so forth. So there, there's actually some logic to that. But we can go even further. Now, what if we had Git support right built in? So we have this Git column here. I can actually show headers. So it might be a bit more, oops, header, header. Um, we have this Git column. And on the right side of the Git column, you have files which were changed locally but not yet staged. And on the left side, you have files which were staged. So we have N for new and M for modified. So this is pretty cool. Alice doesn't really have that. But uh, we also have tree, right? You have this Unix tool called tree, which shows you a file tree. And if you want to have the same in Exa, you can also do like exa-tree. Now, it looks like the same, right? It's essentially the same. But can your tree do this? It can. <laughs> there was a trick question. It can. But um, you have to do. You have to do like D, I actually had to write this down, D, P, right? Like that. <laughs> Not quite as colorful, is it? Um, but now we have, we have seen that Excel can do this, but can your tree do this? No, it can't. And this is amazing, right? You can basically check your structure, and you don't have to alternate between tools like its status all the time, right? Like that. Um, that's pretty amazing. So that's Excel in a nutshell. Let's continue. FD, finding files. Now, uh, personal. Uh, Pet peeve of mine is like find is kind of sucky to be honest in interactive usage. Like if you want to just kind of do something and and like make a fuzzy search for something, it's eh, you always have to put the put the single quotes at the right location, put the asterisk at the right location. That kind of sucks. Now, but we have FD, which is like find, but it doesn't suck for interactive usage and it's colorful as well. So <laughs> you might see a trend here. So. Um, Let's find, let's find all of the readmes in the CPython source code, right? So I have this prepared. So we have find, right? Um, and I have CPython right here. And um, we want to kind of because people can, we have, we have to give I name because uh, it might be case insensitive because people might write readmes and weird kind of capitalization. So go like that. And we have to go like this, readme, asterisk. And then we get all the readmes in CPython. Great. So uh, we can do the same thing with find, uh, with FD. Go like this, FD, and then just source uh, CPython. And it's, it's the same output, but a lot less tedious to type, right? If you compare these guys, a bit less tedious to type. And um, honestly, uh, just nicer to look at because it has colors. But we can go even further, of course. Uh, what if we wanted to find all of the um, Python files in the uh, kernel output, uh, kernel source code actually. Right, we can do that. Or actually, let's do something else. Let's, let's uh, find all of the parser files uh, in the CPython, um, in the CPython source. So we might want to go like this. And we only want to find Python files, so we do like this, right? Um, now we can do the same thing with FD, like this. You have this dash E, which means extension, um, like that. And then we can do the same thing. Right, but now we can keep adding extensions easily, right, like that. For instance, we can find all the, all the RST, probably it has RSTs. It has some, you see. Um, and we can uh, keep adding extensions for that, so we can more easily do this. I have to be honest, I have no idea how to do this in find because you kind of have to like write a regex and maybe make it a subgroup or something. So that's kind of uh, annoying. Uh, another nice feature of find is uh, FD is that it actually uh, uses our git ignore to um, ignore files that we don't want. So if we look at our git ignore right here, it has some, like it has some little example report that I did. There's this ignored file and lo and behold, there's our ignored file. And if we FD for ignore, won't find it, but if we go like U for unrestricted, it will find it. So that's a nice feature because usually you don't want to uh, search for feature uh, for files which are ignored by your git ignore. So that's FD. Continuing. Rip grab. Now many people might have heard about that. It's uh, quite a common tool nowadays. It's insanely fast. It's like grab, but it's really really quick, um, and it's also user friendly and it has amazing colors, uh, and um, it also uses git ignores. So what does this mean in practice? 
Well, how about we search through the whole Linux source code? And we search for buffer, right? The buffer word comes up quite a lot uh, with the Linux uh, context. So I'm just gonna let it run for a little while, but the general idea is that Linux uses a lot of buffers um, and it takes quite a long time. Like it took like nine seconds, as you can see in my shell there. Um, let's do the same thing with rip rip. Oop, there. Oh, fuck me, um, hang on. What the hell? <laughs> oh, uh, because, sorry, uh, because I copied this. Uh, we don't have to have the, we don't have to uh, provide the recursive flag for it, grab it also does this by default. Um, it's quite a bit fast if you see two seconds against nine seconds, uh, but now, um, rip grab also does something nice. It ignores binary files by default, which grab doesn't do. Um, and git is basically a bunch of binary blobs and we don't really need to search that and also it has git ignores by default. So we search a lot less stuff and we usually don't care about all of that stuff. Um, and also if you ch uh, check the, the default way that things are kind of looking, so I have this file here, the API helper, and this is the output for rip grab and this is the default output for um, grab. And you can see here that the output differs quite a bit on the uh, way that uh, we get um, file numbers. I think grab can do this as well, but this is just like comparing the default output. And by default, grab actually doesn't do any um, recursive searching, which if you don't do this, like it just kind of sits there and waits for standard input. It's doesn't, not very useful to be honest, right? So it might make sense to just search that. So this is what grab does. Um, it also allows you to search for specific types of files. So if we provide the file type pi for Python and we search for buffer in the Linux source code, turns out there's actually some occurrences of buffer in Linux, right? So this is all Linux, uh, all Python files, as you can see, in Linux, um, which do some helper tasks. So that was pretty nice to do. And with grab, you kind of have to find all Python files, grab, uh, pipe that into grab, and that's kind of annoying. So that's rip grab. Pretty cool. Um, next up, we have Tokai, or Tokai, I don't know how to pronounce that, but anyway, so it's kind of like clock. Um, not many people have heard about clock actually, but if you want to count your lines of code on the, um, on the command line, usually you would use a uh, Perl script called clock. Now Perl is a language engineered to be the slowest possible scripting language, so it takes a long time actually to do anything in, uh, in uh, Perl, and I can actually demonstrate this by just counting the number of files, uh, the number uh, of source lines in C Python. It takes a little bit of time, but the general idea is that, well, it takes some time, it's the general idea to be honest. So there we go. Um, yeah, it's, it's wrapping, I'm sorry for that, but the, you can see it, it counted this. We get some result. Now Tokai, as an alternative, basically like that, all right? So, it's, it's pretty fast. Um, Tokai allows us to count anything we want, like Linux. Takes a few seconds, but um, I did this with clock and it didn't finish when I, like, it, take, it took minutes, to be honest. Um, we can also see just how many C files there are in uh, Python. We can only count the C files, like T for type. And then turns out there's a few, or sorry, not, no, I'm, I'm saying files, right? But I mean lines of code, of course. Um, so that's Tokai, short and sweet, if you want to count uh, lines of code. It's not colored. I think this is probably the only util utility that we have today that's not colorful. Um, next up, HTTP, a personal favorite of mine. It's like curl, but it's like super user friendly. You know, curl also kind of was made with the ability to be super user unfriendly, like you have to, like, if you actually want to provide JSON or something like that. I, don't, I can't remember the syntax ever, right? Um, but let's try and request, right? Um, so I had to prepare this because I, I really can't. Um, so I have this local loopback HTTP server. So it just gives us that, right? So that, let's do the same thing with HTTP. And for some reason, the command line tool is just called like HTTP, right? This, I can't imagine this ever conflicting with anything at all. So. <laughs> It looks like that. <laughs> so this looks a much, much better, right? Um, and this is the same kind of like output, but it shows us the response headers in a nice kind of uh, formatting, has colors. 
uh, and then it has the, it, it knows it is JSON, and so it parses the JSON and, and kind of formats the JSON as well, right? Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and now, for instance, we can also tell curl to show response headers and request headers and everything, and it looks like that, and I'm like, oof. <laughs> I mean, so these are the request headers because it has these lines going inside or the, the arrows going inside and these are the response headers and the response body, but to be on like, heck. So um, let's, let's use curl to send some data and I had to write this down because it looks like this. So this is some JSON. And then we can't forget to set the headers, always set the headers like that. And then don't forget the method, never forget the method. All right, and it looks like that. And then you have this, all right? And we get this back because it's just like a dummy HTTP server, but you get the idea, right? And this in, in HTTP is like that. I'm not kidding, it's that simple. Um, and uh, yeah, we can actually also show the request headers and everything in HTTP using um, show and then the Basically, it's a bit weird of a syntax, but you get like capital H is, I think, the response headers, and then the request headers is uh, like the lowercase h, and same for body, and then it looks like that. So I think this is pretty cool, right? You can see that. Um, and you can also set headers the same way, so lol uh, rofl or something, and you can see that we set the header lol rofl, right? So that's pretty cool. Let's continue. Um, Bat. Now, bat is an interesting one. Bat is like, like cat, and <laughs> if if cat and ls had an amazing magical unicorn baby, right? And that's kind of what what bat is. Um, it has um, syntax highlighting support, and it has automatic paging support for long files, and it has git support. Now, how that, that how does that possibly work? Well, I can show you. So, um, if I just bat something, like change file. You can see that it has these weird things at the end. Oh, actually, let me show you. Let me show you this. Let me show you this first. So we have API helper, which is, which is a Python program, which does something, right? But it looks like that, right? Not not very interesting. But then we have bat. Looks like that, and it also has a pager built in. So we have like this, right? Um, so we have syntax support. Um, we have uh, on the left side. You, you can see that we have these little squiggles, which means that this line was changed. And I wrote this here. This line was changed. These lines were added, you can see the pluses, um, and it won't use the pager for short files. So if you just go like staged file, it will like basically just not use the pager. It will also give us line numbers, which is nice. And that's essentially all there is to know about bad. Now, obviously never use bad as compared to like cat or less if you want to use, or actually compared to cat, if you want to actually concatenate files. But if you just want to look at files, right, it's pretty cool. And also if you um, bad, uh, binary files, it would just say like binary, and cat is gonna be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so that's that. Um, SD, SD is a short and sweet one. It's basically like said, but people can actually use that without looking up the menu. <laughs> so, um, have a look at this. Um, we have this change file, and we have this replace me replace. So with set, if you actually wanna replace that, we will go like set dash i uh, s slash replace and then something and then g because can't forget the g because it will only replace the first occurrence per line, right? So can't forget the g um, and then this and then change file and then as we, if we bat this again, see it replace it. But with sd, you just go like something, um, change it back to replace and then change file and that will actually have to change it back. Uh, but if you don't want to commit, right? We are a generation of millennials, we can't commit, right? Or if we go like dash p, we can preview that without actually changing the file, so that's pretty cool, right? So that's all there is about SD, which is like set but user-friendly. And then we have hyperfile. Now this is an interesting one. Um, usually in Unix, if you benchmark things, you would, what would you do? You would whip up time, right? And then just run time a bunch of times. I can actually demonstrate that. I have this taxi simulation here, which is a very fast program that does something, and in theory has some output, but we don't show it, but, so if we wanna time that, how long that actually runs for, we can run this a few times, and we have some, like we have some data, but eh, you know, 
Uh, then we have hyperfine, and now watch this. Does some spawn up time to measure something, and then it basically runs the program a few times um, to make sure to sort out these statistical um, errors, and uh, it will actually also take note of the min and max times, and you can see that they were actually quite, quite considerable, right? Um, we can actually tell it to run a few more times, but the general idea is that the program runs quite a few times. Um, in order for it to figure out how long the program really takes in total, right? And so we get the, we, we can execute very quickly terminating programs and still make sure to benchmark them properly. And so now we are down to a delta of like or a plus and minus of 10 milliseconds, which is quite, quite a bit still, but at least, I mean, the program terminates very quickly, but you can imagine how this is useful if you want to benchmark some uh, other tools, right? So. And yeah, you can also specify a warm-up phase if you're into that kind of thing, so where it basically runs the program like a few times beforehand and then completely discards the measurements so just in case you have some kind of I.O. Um, demanding program where you want, your, want to be very sure that the thing that you want to benchmark is absolutely in your I.O. cache, right? So you can do that. Um, it's pretty cool. And now, um, yeah, we have a bonus because we still have a little bit of time. Um, MDP, which is actually the program that I'm using right now to run this, uh, this demonstration, which is basically the Markdown presenter. So you write some Markdown files. It looks like this if you want to be very specific. Um, it looks like this, and this is my talk actually, which is run right now by MDP. And it is like PowerPoint, but it has 1% of the features. But it's all the features that matter, right? <laughs> and it's on the command line. And your PowerPoint can't do that now, can it? Uh, we have another uh, bonus, GenAct. So um, imagine you want to pretend to be doing some work, but don't actually want to do any work. Now what do you do, right? So you can run GenAct and go like CC, and now we're compiling something. <laughs> And you can run genic-m weblog and pretend you're looking at some really, well, or I don't know, kernel compile. You get the idea, right? You can also just run it like and without any arguments, it will go into demo mode and we'll run a few iterations of every kind of program that it has. It has quite a few programs, actually. Uh, has these uh, programs, you can run that. So you can do this, all right? I don't know, you get the idea, right? Um, so I, I'm glad you like it because it's actually the only program in this whole list that I've written myself, so thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, yeah, we have uh, one more bonus, which is a very short and sweet one, ASCII Aquarium. It's just like that, right? You have fish on your command line. We have one more, and then I'm done, which is C-Matrix, probably everybody knows this, but <laughs> still, for completeness sake. Um, yeah, thank you for much. Yeah, thank you very much, Sven, for this very colorful talk. Are there any questions or comments? Um, does FD also have uh, a statement like execute? Uh, yes, it does. In fact, it also has a batch statement for execute. So if you want to have, if you want to get rid of X arcs, you can do that instead. So it, it's pretty cool, actually. Much less painful to use. So when you have questions, you can also line up at the microphones on the side. Uh, there was a second science after your like command line, like after master, like three seconds and so on. What what's that like? Oh yes, I, ah, oh my God. okay, so that's, yeah, yeah, like I see, yeah, so if you run a command which takes a few seconds to execute, after one second my shell will, like, it will always keep track of the command and it will show you how long that command took, always, so you can't forget that. And you use a like uh, RC file or, or what? Uh, it's actually called liquid prompt, it's for a uh, Cish shell and it's, it's a, yeah, for, for the ZSH. Yeah, so, Z shell like. Yeah, uh, for that, and it's a, like a special prompt which has this thing built in where 
basically it only shows you what you need to know. You, you can see I also like this is my my Git state currently. It's like almost Z shell kind of no. No, well it's a it's a it's a special prompt for Z shell. Mm. It, yeah, there's also, oh. also a bash version of that. It's it's pretty cool. I can recommend Liquid Prompt. More questions? Uh, no, I forgot the question. <laughs> Don't worry, so you can catch so me later. Um, maybe in the meantime, you can tell us uh, how this fade in fade out works. Uh, I actually don't know. I think it uses NZ color codes, but I don't actually know. Um, but I, I actually wanted to look that up. Uh, the back page, do you know if it has an option to print to the alternative screen? So when you close it, it doesn't show up in your shell? Ah, there? I see. So this is just a normal uh, thing shell feature where you can press uh, Control Z in order to background the task. And then you have this, you can see this, this one sleeping process here which is now sleeping, which is my presentation, you can type jobs to see which jobs are currently sleeping, it's just this, all right? And then I can press FG to foreground this again, and that's pretty cool. Okay, so I mean, uh, oh, sorry, I, well, let, let's, uh, let's, I can show you outside. Okay. So if you're ever running graphics, what kind of window manager do you use? Uh, well, I use graphics right now, actually. I'm not really oh, yeah, on the command line, I'm actually lying. It's, uh, I use uh, i3. i3. Okay. As you can see, it's just normal a3 stuff, right? Which, I can do this, right? What terminal is that? Is that uh, this is the uh, termite terminal. Ah, termite. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Do you use any other tools related to terminal work which increase your productivity or ergonomics? For example, well, I, uh, I think the best tool uh, I found is a drop-down terminal. I use Yakuak. Maybe some other tips or tools you use or your work. Uh, well, so originally I wanted to show off WIM um, because this, I also put this in the title of the presentation or in the, in the description text. And uh, I figured we didn't have enough time for that, for, for a whole WIM thing. Um, so I use WIM a lot for everything. Really, I do everything. No, without team. I just use i3 and just keep opening terminals. I don't like the double kind of window management. I know that there's tools to make that easier, but honestly, I like to keep it simple and that just have just uh, a lot, lots of i3 uh, windows. In fact, I have 10 open desktops right now and all of them full of windows. So I use a lot of windows. Uh, one question here. Uh, is RipGrab faster than SilverSearch? Uh, yes, at least. Uh, I mean, so I used to use the SilverSearch, so the question was whether uh, RipGrab is faster than the, the, the SilverSearcher, which is another tool that looks a lot like Grab and also has colors and also same defaults. Um, the basic philosophy of RipGrab and AG or the SilverSearcher are much the same. It's just that RipGrab just happens to be like five times faster in the benchmarks. So. Makes some difference, I suppose, with very large repositories. Uh, do you recommend using Tmux? Well, so I use quite a bit of Tmux, but honestly not for development, more for, well... Looks nice. Well, it looks nice. I just, I don't know. So I, I know Tmux is very popular with um, OSX people because they don't have a proper uh, native window manager. I think nowadays they do, but um, generally speaking, I don't really like window management in Tmux so much as I like it in i3. And I don't want to manage them like in, in two ways. Can all these uh, apps that you demonstrated be installed with Pac-Man or? Yes. Okay. Um, in fact, I package most of them for Arch Linux, but um, also for other distributions and also for Windows and OS X. Uh, so they're all available in Brew, I think. And they, are also all, they also all have pre-compiled binaries for Windows, which just work. How difficult it is for you to reproduce the same environment on another system? Uh, pretty easy. I mean, it depends on how much control I get. Uh, since most of these tools that I demonstrated are written in Rust and have static binaries, you can just kind of get the binaries, download them, and they will always keep working, except for HTTP Pi, which sadly is a Python, and the distribution is a bit more complicated. I know it's a bit, you know, it's a weird thing to say here, but um, yeah, Python distribution is uh, still not a 
a solved problem, I think. But uh, yeah, it's pretty easy to re replicate the environment. Do you use any other displays like a status bar or anything like that? Sorry, come again? Um, do you use anything else like a status bar or any other kinds of displays? Oh, yes. Um, well, so I use Polybar for, for displaying my, my system stuff, but I like to keep the uh, output to a minimum. Like, I'm not into very flashy, conky stats and stuff like that because I never look at them anyway. Just like, keep it simple and make sure that the system has enough battery time. Cool. Very, very uh, much uh, thank you to Sven. Give a uh, warm hand to Sven.